The last few weeks have been maddening for me, and it's been all as a result of my complete and extraordinary failure to draw a line under a number of Allen-based cinematic tasks, and others too. Whenever I think I'm there, something breaks or isn't quite right, therefore denying me enough footage to do a coherent episode. I'm conscious about some disjointed multi-episodal sagas we've had in months past. There's the reflex stove, a clever bracket, very expensive stainless steel foil, a totally useless heater, and me being slowly lowered into a tank of water. None of them are ready to cut together. And then this. Some observant viewers amongst you will know that I'm not really into the heat. This famously scorched corner of our world, England, is rather warm at the moment. Installing aircon into Allen would be a rather short-termist operation, so that's out. Anyhow, onward to eventual victory we stride. I can show you a beginning-to-end story. You'll recall our discovery of a very rusty exhaust last time. Glass fibre lagging once damp stays damp, unless there's hundreds of degrees of heat driving out that moisture from within. For years, Alan's engine was barely run at all. So I'm completing the dusty job of getting the rest of the lagging off and the whole assembly out of Alan's side hatch. I could leave it lagged, but the exhaust weldy people need to see the original one bare so that they can quote for the job. As I progressed, the extent of the carnage grew yet clearer. Whole chunks of rust fell away, not just dust and flakes. The rope lagging was damp to the touch. Thank goodness Alan warned us now, prior to prolonged time at sea. The bolts at the engine end looked grim, so I used some penetrating spray to help me out a few minutes later. The other end was a little easier, although of course the fourth of the four bolt threads jammed and needed grinding off from the outside. I was actually a little concerned about how stuck on the corroded forward end would be, but it actually popped off okay. Two bolts come out fully, but the other two are captive. I wanted to replace the whole lot for a fresh set, but we'll have to clean those captive ones up and see if they'll do. I'll get new shiny brass nuts as well. Luckily, most of the disintegrating exhaust was by now spread all over the floor and filling the bilge, so there wasn't much steel left. This meant wiggling it free and lifting was child's play. I'm going to keep the exhaust intact for now so the dimensions can be matched. Otherwise, I think I'll keep the design roughly the same, except with a flexi section to reduce vibration and stress on the interfaces either end, a midway support, and maybe the silencer in a tweak format. I'll get the flanges laser or water cut. Also, I've heard you all on steel choice. I promise I do read all comments. I'm in talks with workshops at the moment. 316 stainless might be possible, although as far as our inquiries have gone with the silencer from another grade, 304 stainless for the whole system is a little cheaper, so it is an option. But definitely not cheap 400 series stainless. Also, the treatments and hassle to protect a mild steel exhaust outweigh the savings, so that's out too. Remember this is a dry exhaust, not immersed, and is protected from the elements, so providing I get better lagging, there's limited corrosion risk. I couldn't enjoy myself filming a rusty exhaust outdoors all day, but I knew what awaited me back on board. That said, the cleanup, sped up and in hindsight, was rather satisfying. This is the first time I've had sight and access to this part of the engine bay, so I can take the opportunity to clean and repaint into corners and nooks I missed the first time around. Also, my first ever peek inside Alan's turbocharger. I have a cursory understanding of turbos, but asked advice as to what to look for. First, to be careful when inspecting, as the turbine is designed and balanced with fine tolerances. I needed to check that there was no lateral play or movement, and likewise back and forth. It seemed to spin smoothly. I was also assured that the soot isn't a drama. I could carefully brush out a little, but a proper high revs run the next time I fire Alan up will help clear that. It's dry in there, and no oily gunk. This is also a good sign, so my mini-examination gave the turbo a clean bill of health. By this point, the slim portion of my internal sense of humour allocated to coping with hot weather had diminished somewhat. Alan therefore received a gift. Wonderful little thing. Good exterior to interior dimensions ratio, a clear display, quick to cool down from 35 to 5 degrees, and it only draws a few amps at 12 volts. It deserves to have a long-term home on Alan, where, though, is to be decided. Still unconvinced as to whether the direct sunlight outside was outweighed by a light breeze, I did need to complete the penultimate phase of that infernal searchlight housing, doubling up as a step from Alan's bow end to upper deck. I had all that mucking around with the height and position on the 3D curved surface, and have now decided on the location. It needs a full range of swivel without clashing with the floodlight, and vice versa. 
Some precision, sharpie work later, the next job was to rub back the surface. Through Alan's pristine new paint job, through the gel coat, which was impressively thick, and until fiberglass was exposed. I wanted a strong fiberglass to fiberglass bond. Dust all having been vanquished, and it was time to squirt on some remnants of a tube of 5200, the famed hyper-strong adhesive of the boating world. The old nozzle was clogged, and I decided not to waste another, as this was the tube's final assignment before, well, empty sealant tube oblivion. A little gorilla tape to ensure no slippage, and a full three days were needed for the bond to strengthen and cure. The adhesive on the Gorilla Tape is as strong as hell, and will rip off even a good paint job if you leave it stuck on for too long. These short tabs though don't matter, as you'll see. I spent an hour or so packing the gaps. I decided it would take forever to perfectly match the profile of the orange shell to the profile of the housing base, so instead I squeezed in a dense ring of glass fibre offcuts in an epoxy resin base. Once cured, I sanded back any lumps, bumps and sharp snaggy bits. Next, yes there's always a next with this damn thing, the flaps of fiberglass to secure and seal the join. I pre-folded the strip so that they would take on the right angle shape more easily and not spring back out, leaving a weakening air void. My plan was to only glass a few layers. That 5200 is monstrously strong on its own. Fiberglass sponges up and wets out with resin exceedingly well. This meant that before even deploying the epoxy resin, a quick reminder that it's wise to use epoxy if on previously cured polyester resin composites parts, I decided to use a special resin compatible spray glue. It's a godsend when trying to get multiple layers into place and staying there when springiness or gravity isn't on your side. Then I could laminate with resin at leisure. Or at my partial leisure as the direct sunlight and deeply unsporting temperature caused the medium speed resin to gel and cure at warp speed. The remnants in the pot quickly heated up, smoked and nearly set itself on fire. Anyhow, the housing is on. It needs polycarb windows, wires fed through glands, a paint job and a magnet. Completion is due shortly prior to Prince George's coronation. Folks, we now have stickers, various backgrounds and sizes. Removable bumper stickers are arriving soon too, so you can adorn your cars, phones, laptops, bottles and even yourselves with more Allen. Pure excellence. Bye.